Fantastic. <laughs> right. Well, let's kick off then. Well, welcome everyone and thanks so much for joining uh, to, to listen to our talk about work we did this summer about uh, hunting for Caliprobola speciosa in the new forest. And um, yeah, so I'm Andy Murdoch. I'm uh, a mapping professional by trade. Um, I guess I'd class myself as an enthusiastic amateur when it comes to hoverflies. I've been involved with the the Facebook group for about three years now and I basically post sightings from my garden and also um, a few sites uh, around where I live uh, where I volunteer for the Woodland Trust and Eastleigh Borough Council. Um, so yeah that's that's me. I'm also going to just get Paul to introduce himself as well who is um, uh, the other person who's leading this but as I'll explain later we're part of a, a bigger team but yeah over to you Paul. <coughs> Thanks, Andy. Yeah, I'm Paul Stevens. Um, I'm the guy who makes everybody jealous in the winter because I live in a pool <laughs> where uh, hoverflies just don't don't stop. They run all year round, and um, I normally get a Christmas Day hoverfly. Um, it just takes a little bit of good weather, and uh, all sorts of things are, are coming out. Uh, I've only been doing it for three years, but the the addiction level has not dropped yet, so I could be on it for life who knows but that's me anyway excellent thanks a lot paul okay so um just a reminder um sorry i'm clicking in the wrong place uh, this session is being recorded so um if you could when uh, while we're while we're talking um just mute your microphones and um that'd be great just um so that we don't get any unexpected interruptions there will be an opportunity to ask questions um at the end but also if you want to post any messages in the chat and questions we can sort of allocate some time to go through those and any that we don't deal with we can perhaps deal with via the group or, or directly via email but but yeah that's um that's the, the housekeeping done so i guess first of all a bit of background well this all came about from various calls to action from roger morris on the facebook group and the earliest i could find related to the uh, something off the back of the hoverfly species status review that they did where Basically, they were getting anecdotal evidence that were saying that local people um, who, who observed in the forest were, were noticing that uh, Caliprobola Calip speciosa was getting rarer. And um, the, um, but, but there was no real data to, to sort of back it up. Up until 2021, there was only 90 records in the Hoverfly Recording Scheme database. So basically Roger was encouraging people to go out and look for it and try and increase records. So, so that's the, the sort of initial background and you know the, the, with a very much an emphasis on maybe not just all flocking to the, the known honeypot sites um, during uh, in the process. So in 2021 at least five of us were already out searching independently on the back of those sort of calls and, and in a rather ad hoc way and last year Colin Easton managed to locate uh, uh, locate it at the, a new site in uh, Prat Prattley Wood, and that was great because um, you know it was also um, sort of increasing the range slightly to the northwest of its current known sites. So that was um, all very interesting and and um, and good. But we were basically all out um, working in a quite an uncoordinated way. And not really learning from each other's experience, uh, especially from Colin, who'd, who'd obviously found it that year. So uh, when the call came out again in 2020, uh, late 2021, uh, to try and uh, do it, do some more work on it, uh, the, the species Calipro, I can't say it, <laughs> Caliprobola speciosa. Um, basically, the idea was to um, to try and work in a more coordinated way. So. As what essentially what we did was we we used the Facebook group to try and raise awareness and connect each other and Paul produced this rather splendid um, uh, uh, flyer and poster to try and uh, gain support for the for the surveys so see if we could work together as a team and I'm pleased to say that we managed to get this motley crew together um, which are the the surveyors that, that took part this year and and um, yeah so that's just to say that you know although this talk is by Paul and myself um, the, the 
that several of these people are on on the on the call as well and and uh, uh, obviously a really key part of the of the work so at that point i'm going to hand over to paul to talk about the um the identification and some of the of what we know about the species already so over to you paul and i'll do the slide advance for you okay yeah well let's have the next slide then please uh, handy um that's <laughs> That sort of promotional poster I did got lots of likes, but when I actually looked at them, um, an awful lot of likes were from people in Scotland and Northern England who weren't by any stretch of the imagination going to jump in their car and drive down to Southern Hampshire for a spot of um, a spot of hoverating. But never mind, um, enough turned up to get some work done. For those of you who don't know a lot about Calibribola speciosa, and I find it as difficult as Andy to say the name. Um, it's quite a special hoverfly. It's classed under xylotini, which is basically all those hoverflies whose larva prefer to um, be in a, a, a dead wood environment predominantly. Um, things like more common ones in that um, category are uh, Xylota cygnus and, and that kind of other fly. This one's in a genus of its own and it's quite different from all the others. You can't really mistake it for anything else. Um, it's quite big, maybe not quite volucella size in, in bulk. It, it's more long and thin, but it's big and it's quite spectacularly coloured. Uh, I must obviously point out that all this information from me is, is second hand because I've never seen it live in the flesh, sadly. Um, maybe that will be that will happen next summer. Uh, fingers crossed. But yeah, it's it's as you can see from those two photographs on the screen at the moment, it's got a lot of black and metallic green and gold in it. The wings are orange. The legs are orange. So is the face. Um, I really can't wait till I till I I get a photograph of it because it, it's something that's a special experience in the UK hoverfly spotting. Um, the face you can see in the next slide, please, Andy, is quite extraordinary. Um, here's a photograph and a half of that Andy got hold of from somebody he met in the forest. Um, Look at that face protruding. It's not the nose, but it's protruding face with the um, orange antenna stuck on the end. And to get a shot of a pair in cop, um, I must admit, I'll be leaping up and down for a week if I manage to, to find that one. Um, so that's the what large, colorful, uh, and sadly quite rare. Um, the where, next slide, Andy, thanks. Uh, these days, apparently, as far as we know, in this country, it's confined uh, just to the New Forest and to Windsor Forest Stroke Great Park. Um, historically, there are records dotted around over the rest of the country. Some may be bogus. They're, as you can see from the slide, um, there are records uh, from Derbyshire and Yorkshire, but um, Recently, it's only ever been found in those two locations there. Um, in Roger and Stuart's book, it was given a status of near threatened, which um, they, they thought, um, as far as they knew, it was limited in location. It wasn't widespread, but in those locations, on the right time, in the right place, it could be found fairly easily. And this is one of the things we were trying to test with our our project. The, the when, there's only one brood a year, so there's just one uh, flight period. There are some very early records in April. I must admit, Andy and I went out in April. He was mega keen to get out in the field and, and find one of these buggers. Um, <laughs> I remember wearing a, a duvet jacket while I was out there, and surprise, surprise, we didn't find anything, but we had a good recce. But the, the best chances of finding uh, Caliprovola are from 
the second half of May and the first bit of June. Um, that's going on, on, on past records when they've been found in the past. Um, so that's the when. Um, let's talk a little bit about its life cycle because that determines partly where it's found. Um, I don't know whether we've got any of the larval enthusiastics listening uh, in the audience at the moment, but quite honestly, for such a magnificent um, hoverfly, that uh, larva picture bottom right is a bit of a it's underwhelming put it that way um but you know little things turn into big exciting looking adults and that lava likes rotten wood particularly beech wood it likes it to be quite damp and porridge like apparently and in the uk as far as we can see it's mostly found in the decaying um heartwood and roots of large mature and old fallen down um beech trees which is the fagus genus that you can uh, see up on the slide um <laughs> we did or at least andy did thrust his arm into a lot of uh, rotten stumps um just to see what was in there really and at the level we were looking most of the rot was really quite dry the weather had been dry for a while um, it wasn't a porridge like consistency by any means, but maybe lower down at root level it was. I, it's very hard to tell. Um, so, it obviously, needs uh, an environment, a habitat that's got um, deciduous woodland, non commercial, i.e., where trees are left to grow old, to become mature, and to die in a natural way and then to rot down and produce this perfect habitat for Caliprobola to um, lay eggs and for its larva to develop. Uh, next slide, please, Andy. I'm sure all of you have um, spent time recently reading the uh, European Red List of Hoverflies, uh, uh planning and assessment documents which came out yes were published yesterday um i, I jest that it's a enormous um document i did delve into it to see if there's anything useful about um our target hoverfly in there it did say that for europe caliprobola speciosa is uh its status is of least concern in other words it's fairly common in the right environment and there's no immediate threat uh, to its existence on this slide you can see something produced recently by stuart um, showing its distribution in the uk belgium and netherlands netherlands apparently is it's pretty much as rare as it is here though obviously large areas of deciduous forest aren't that common uh, in the Netherlands. One of the nice things about the Netherlands is uh, the way their name for Caliprobola translates. When you translate it into English, as I did on Google, it turns out as the dual glider, um, which I guess marks it out for its appearance and its, its rarity, really, the dual glider. I think that's lovely. In Belgium, though, it's a different story. It's actually expanding its range. Quite what's happening right there, we're not uh, entirely sure. Andy of I and I have um, have been tempted to initiate a, a scientific project in Belgium, which would be, uh, if we can get funding, um, it would be something like the search for Caliprobola and beer tasting Belgian trip. Um, but uh, we think those two things that go really well together. And uh, obviously, if anybody else wants to join us, they'd be very welcome. Um, the only other thing that came to light from the European perspective is again something in the, um, the red list that was produced yesterday, where it was described as a hoverfly that lives on the rotted wood and timber of evergreen oak 
which was a new one to me. Uh, all right, we haven't got a whole forest of evergreen oak in this country. We've got a fair bit. And uh, um, local nature reserves down my way anyway, uh, at the moment, trying to get rid of it because it's uh, an introduced species. Um, whether any of the woodland down here that's got evergreen oak in is old enough for there to be mature and rotting trees, I, I really don't know. But uh, maybe that's something we, we could look at uh, this year. Um, OK, next slide, Andy, please. So just the two sites currently known in this country. One of them is a problem site in that access is not normally given. It's not public access. And quite a few eminent um, entomologists who've asked um, to see sites which are basically under the royal estate um, have not been able to get permission to look there. So the new forest is our, is our best chance in, in finding what the status of Caliprobola speciosa actually is. There are two traditional hotspots. And as far as we could see, um, that's where most interested recorders tended to go to look for it, which gives us a bit of a sort of chicken and egg conundrum. Um, is Caliprobola speciosa really limited to just those two hotspots? And therefore, all recorders go there because they won't find it anywhere else. Or is it the other way around? Um, it's only found there because that's the only place people go and look for it. And that's, again, one of the conundrum that we were trying to focus on last summer to see whether it was prevalent in other areas of, uh, of the new forest. Um, I think last, my last slide, please, Andy. When you're looking for this elusive hoverfly, um, all the previous evidence seemed to say, look in sunny spots, look around beech trees, particularly rotting tree stumps. There was a little evidence to say it does visit flowers. Um, we've got no idea what flowers. The European evidence uh, mentions white umbellifers. Um, at the time we were looking, the forest wasn't particularly well endowed with white umbellifers. It wasn't particularly endowed with any flowers. Um, Later on in, in that period when we were looking, bracken um, started to take over any areas where flowers would be. Um, so that became a problem anyway. Sites I visited in the middle of May were becoming quite inaccessible by the middle of June. Um, the evidence from other people's remarks say, yeah, a sunny situation, somewhere sheltered, um, it will sit around in hollows where beech trees have fallen over. Um, it will sit around on leaves of vegetation. Um, but it does take a fair bit of patience um, to actually find the thing. So that's Caliprobola, what, where and when. I'm uh, going to hand you back to Andy to talk a little bit more about um, how our project last year developed. Thanks. That's great. Thanks a lot, Paul. You can all hear me still, yeah? Yep. Good stuff. Um, right, yeah, so in terms of methodology, um, we basically were obviously trying to build on all this effort that was going on independently previously and, and do it in a more coordinated way, but obviously having to recognise the fact that you know, people have other commitments, and um, you know, we're not, we're not, we're all volunteers essentially, mostly, well, pretty much exclusively amateurs, and so um, yeah, we don't have the opportunities um, to, to to dedicate huge amounts of time to this. It was more that hopefully, if we get enough people, we can spread our our activity, and by coordinating our efforts, we we maximise our our effort. So, in order to do that, we were obviously guided by existing records. Um, where it had been seen you know, currently, we, we've we got the, the known habitat preferences that Paul's just taken you through. But also um, we had a, a data set, which I'll talk about more in a, a second, uh, and also uh, an online map to help sort of track where people might like to go and where people have been. And again, I'll explain a bit more about that. And then obviously we had sort of advice from people like Roger, who, who were helpful in kind of guiding the, the, the overall approach. So um, 
but very much we were had this emphasis on trying to get to new sites and seeing where it was um or whether we might be able to find it outside of the traditional uh, squares and so um that was our our starting point we'll come back to talk about that at the end but um and the other thing to say was that this is only visual um visual work you know we weren't collecting specimens we weren't using nets we weren't we didn't have permission to use nets in the forest so because the 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 Calipribola uh, speciosa is so um, distinctive, you know, it should be well suited to visual work and, and photograph identification. So that was the, the rationale. The Woodland Trust um, have a really great data set called the Ancient Tree Inventory, which was real, uh, you know, one of the, the key data sets in, in helping us try and target our effort. So this is an online database um, that allows you to kind of search your area and click and find out information about individual trees and very kindly through the volunteering route that I have they they provided us with a, a cut of the data for the whole of the new forest so I could take it into mapping system and and, and try to sort of analyze it and come up with some sites um, so that was a, a really useful uh, source of information and it's obviously uh, quite an interesting website so I've got the link there for you to go and take a look at but um, but then we obviously had to prioritize the site. So this is uh, Paul in his puffer jacket. Oh, duvet jacket. Yeah, I told you. <laughs> yeah, earlier in the season, sort of, we did a few reckeys, tried to get a feel for, you know, what what how we might approach this whole thing. But largely, it boiled down to to those reckeys, the the approach I'm going to talk about, and then some local knowledge as well. So the idea was that we use the ancient tree inventory to filter out all the beach. So that was mostly you know common beach but also included copper beach and a few other things not much of it in the forest to be honest but um, we included those as well we we ruled out everything that was was private so that was a, a another sort of filter and then the remainder was was to kind of score the trees based on their status so we have these different categorizations in the data set alive collapsed, dead, felled, unknown. There was only a couple of entries for collapsed and unknown, but essentially this just gave a slightly higher priority for, for sites where there were dead and felled trees. Um, so you'd have stumps, stumps essentially. Um, and then what we did was use the, the mapping software to aggregate um, the totals up for a grid square. And then that led to this map, which was our prioritization map. So the red areas, the red squares are all the, the, the squares where there's existing records from uh, Hubfly Recording Scheme and MBN. And then the blue are our prioritization, low, medium, high, based on those scores we just mentioned. So the idea was that we would use that map uh, to target our effort. And then these grey empty squares are ones that are um, based on sort of local knowledge, you know, where we know that there are beech trees of some size and might be worth exploration so then what we, i did was publish that map as a web page where uh, people could go and look so at the start it looked like this all the squares were gray and you could go in and interrogate them to see you know what was going on and then the idea was that as the surveys progressed we um we updated the map to color in the squares that were had been surveyed and also to add any notes so you can see from the from the, the map you know we, we covered quite a lot of ground um we, we you know we didn't obviously cover every single bit of every single um, square and not all of the habitat was suitable anyway but it just gives you an indication of how much um of our target areas we actually covered and we added a few more during the survey so these empty uh, red ones were added um in addition to what we had already planned the gray ones we planned to visit but didn't quite get to but you know it was a pretty good effort i thought um and and just having the map allowed us to show where people were planning to go which is this little dotted line and um and basically you could see that you weren't going to duplicate effort by going to the same site on the same day without any knowledge of other people being there so that was the kind of um way we coordinated it and you know most of us um, were finding lots of stumps, you know, lots of veteran beach, uh, big stumps like this, but we weren't finding uh, Caliprobola speciosa. Um, and partly, you know, we, we felt that that was because, you know, a lot of these trees, although they were there, they weren't, they weren't getting sun all of the day. And so, you know, we, we, we just didn't feel that 
we had a huge amount of chance um, finding any hovers sort of sunning themselves as we as we were there. You'd have to sort of time your visit, sort of in in or or, or find them in more open areas. These stumps. The other thing, as Paul mentioned, was there were very few flowering plants at all. You know, there's a bit of wood sorrel, torn until I saw some holly in flower, but not not like you would see, um, you know, elsewhere. And and you know, we can sort of sort of speculate reasons for that, which we'll come back to. But this is the sort of thing we were finding. You know, large stumps, large fallen tree. This this one on the left is an, an enormous beech that's come down at acres down near uh, Lindhurst and. Um, you know that's a, a, a mega tree. It's created an enormous gap, but again, it's it's not. It's relatively recent, and it's you know not going to be in, in sun all of the day. And um, yeah, and it's and it's still at a very early stage of rot. Although when I walked past it the other day, it was covered in porcelain mushrooms and oyster mushrooms. So presumably, it <laughs> start to be broken down over time. Um, but yeah, a large. Um, trunks as well lying prostrate on the ground as, and 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 sort of stumps in 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 various situations shaded and not shaded and you can see from this this one you know this is a proper christopher robin beech tree pollarded probably hundreds of years ago um absolutely enormous thing so you, know, you can imagine that coming down how much sort of dead wood is lying around and and the, the sort of uh, situations that are, are there and and certainly from walking around the forest the storms of last winter have brought quite a lot of new stuff down as well so these are just a couple of examples i spotted um and uh, clearly you know that's that's creating a potential habitat for the future but um yeah so getting on to um so that's a lot of information about stumps not very exciting we didn't find a huge amount but then i'll take you on to the sightings that we did have and I, I, initially, the first sighting wasn't actually from us. It was from, um, we, we heard on the grapevine about somebody seeing up to five um, Caliprobola speciosa um, at, at the traditional site, Denny Wood, and around these, what they call the cathedral beaches, which are these really tall um, beech trees um, uh, that stand in sort of more open areas. And there's there's a few of them together, and they're quite massive things and really impressive to sort of be around but obviously uh that got us all a bit excited because we obviously knew they were on the wing at, at that point and so uh that was great then roger passed on a record that he'd verified via i record of of another one seen at again the other honeypot site mark ash wood uh, on the 21st of may so a little bit later um and so yeah then the sort of game was on really then uh, so at that point, there were several of us out in the forest looking and um, and uh, and still not having much joy, and uh, including Colin, who followed up um, uh, on on that last site in Marrakesh Wood, but didn't manage to to locate it. So uh, yeah, it was getting a bit sort of frustrating and and so on. But basically, then on the twenty seventh of May, he got a glimpse of one in Brinken Wood, but but was unable to photograph it. So obviously, by this point, we're we're all getting very excited, and um, eventually, um, on the twenty eighth of May, his hard work paid off, and and Colin, who'd, who'd seen one the year before, managed to 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 locate one at Mark Ash Wood. Um, so that was great. That was a male, as you say, absolutely stunning. This one obviously stuck around a while, and and Colin's on the on the call, so um, he, he'll be able to tell us a bit more about the nature of the of the the finding. But you can see it stuck around for a while and posed for photographs, and it's an absolutely stonking thing. And um, yeah, we're all uh, suitably jealous at that point. Um, and then uh, at the same time, he also posted the stump um, that where it was seen. And again, you can just see from this just how how different the situation is from some of those that we were showing earlier. Where you know this is wide out in the open. It's a you know a single stump in this case, but you know well exposed to to the to the sunlight and. Um, yeah, so very much a different situation. And Colin had obviously clearly got his eye in because then about a week later, he turned one up in a completely new site south of one of the squares, uh, a place called Brinkenwood. So uh, another male by the looks of it. And um, yeah, so all, all, all good. And um, and again, the situation of the stump is is very much in the open. 
um you know it's a it's a wide open very old rotted stump and it was seen on and around that uh, location and there's an awful lot of that pernicious bracken there starting to grow very fast around there as well yes and and that was another thing we wanted to sort of pick up on was just that the timing of this you know get into those stumps later on or, or, or having them the same exposure is, 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 you know, it's much harder as that brack, bracken grows, I think, you know, be up to your sort of head height by the time uh, the end of June arrives, potentially. So I'd love to say at that point that we all spurred on by those successes went out and, and, and found it. But unfortunately they were the only two records from our group, um, and you know, and and the only records we're aware of for 2022 were the the, the two and plus the other four I've just mentioned. So, you know, it's not not a lot really, as my son said <laughs> last night, uh, for for the amount of effort. And you can see the from the red squares, you know, just how much ground we covered. We went to known sites, and um, yeah, it was it was quite surprising. I, I think that. Um, well, maybe not that surprising because you know we, we were testing whether it was declining, but you know we we would we would think we were hoping we might see a few more than that. Um, what was interesting though was obviously um, the fact that you know a lot of these sightings were in very open areas, you know, and very different to what a lot, a lot of the the forest was like. You know, the, the Denny Wood and Markash Wood are, are, are really sort of spectacular places, very open sort of lawns and. Um, single massive trees and, and isolated stumps and um, you know all of the sightings were in locations like that. This photograph was taken when I bumped into George Else who is um, he's a he's a bee expert you, you've probably seen his double volume book that's been published recently but he's he I bumped into him and, and got chatting to him and he, he's very familiar with the site and was pointing out several of the stumps where he'd seen Caliprobola speciosa before and um, you know it matched what what the, the sorts of sites that we were we were we were um, where where we knew there was success this year. So that obviously got us all a bit obsessed with stumps and <laughs> what what the right type of stump is. So between us all, we've 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 got hundreds of photos probably of stumps that are promising and um, you know ones that we want to check out. I guess so the the jury's still out on you know what exactly the age needs to be or the level of decay or the level of um sun but more open certainly seems to be um important uh, and as i say you know we've got several of these examples from different um observers uh, across the forest and then also crucially um you know for some of those we we, we didn't do this in a in a systematic way we, we were kind of just taking photos and 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 tracking our our routes and things but we we do have and probably this is a job for the winter quite good information to, um on some of the locations of these 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 trees so we'll be able to go back and collate that information and turn it into a target map because we've got geotag photos and so on so the idea is to use that um, to, to help us find it again in the future to relocate those stumps. And, you know, some of them are pretty distinctive. And, and as Paul said, I, I did sort of have a bit of a route around in uh, in, the, in some of this stuff. Um, the, the literature that I found talks about it being in the, the, the decaying wood of tree stumps and right down to the roots. But we don't really know any more of that so there's definitely scope to do more work and i'm not sure about the the sort of impact of going digging around in some of this stuff or what what would happen if you got, got caught doing it without permission so we'd probably have to talk to the, the relevant people uh, landowners and you know forestry commission and so on but you know you can see from that it's the right sort of thing based on what we've heard you know these very rotten stumps as, as paul said it was very dry at the time though so uh, yeah, and then we also found some other you know interesting larval habitat for hoverflies. This this stump in particular, this tree in particular, um, was full of water when I went past, although there was nothing in it when I when I looked. But I'm not the most knowledgeable on larvae at the moment. Um, in addition to to the stumps, there's also as as Paul said, you know these these xylotini are very much uh, uh, associated with dead wood, and you know it certain seemed to me. That certain types of log in a certain state of decay and a certain moisture level were more promising than others. So as we walked around, we we were able to 
to sort of find various things and know which ones were more more likely to be promising than others and I think there's scope to do more to try to understand that but just to give you a flavour of some of the species we did find so this is Brachypalpus lafriformis it's not one I'd seen before um, so I was really chuffed to, to see it for the first time it was seen by six of our, our team so m most of us saw it um, and the total of 13 was seen and it's just a really great looking hoverfly it's a very hairy sort of beastie um, quite quite big and yeah it's quite impressive um, to, to stumble across we also saw lots of uh, Calcosurfus nemorum, and um, again six of us saw it and in total there was 39 that was the second most numerous hoverfly after xylota, xylota cygnus so yeah again it's very much associated with fallen trees and, and in ancient forests so again um, a good one to to spot as you're walking around looking at dead wood and then finally um, uh, Microdon analis which um, again four of us saw and we saw up to 12 and you know I thought beforehand these would have been super super rare but you know I, I just I, I didn't expect to, to come across across them at all it was another new one for me and um, so that was great um, and and so obviously you know looking at the the, 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 the distributions of, of those all together probably in the future if we had more data would be quite informative just to see whether there is this sort of surface suite that that might all be associated with with this type of habitat you know they're obviously exploiting slightly different niches in the um in the uh, in in those wood, wood uh, bed woods you know the you know that microdon is associated with ants and you know uh, caliprovola we've already heard is is more into this porridge like uh, root system um, and, and rotten um, material but it would be interesting to when we get more data just to see if we can relate the um the two together but certainly some of the squares i don't know if you can see my cursor but some of the squares were, were correlating in that regard where we had sightings of caliprobola speciosa we were also getting microdon analis calcosurfus and morum and brachypalpus left before so um yeah it'd be interesting to explore that future but i don't think we've got enough data at the moment to to say much about it just looking at, we've, we've mentioned a few of the hoverflies, but taking all of the hoverflies in total, um, we had seven recorders out there between the 15th of April to the 16th of June. We did 34 visits, and that included, you know, a visit was basically a day at a particular location, although you, we might have moved um, a little bit around that location, but it's quite a l large number of sites. Um, uh, but in total, we only managed to find 154 hoverflies, uh, or sorry, we only made 154 hoverfly records, and then 10 of them were nil returns. So it's not a huge number, uh, and we had 20 full species and only um, 199 individual hoverflies. And Paul at the time came up with a, <laughs> a metric called hoverflies per hour, which you might have seen um on the facebook post but it was very low in the forest compared to most of our gardens it was depressingly so, low I, I i i think you need to see hoverflies to keep yourself going to think oh yeah i'm finding stuff and if you spend all day in the forest and you see one every hour it, it is a bit of a downer the first time i ever went looking in the forest I told myself as I drove home, never again. That's it. I'm not not going to Hampshire looking for hoverflies anymore. But uh, somehow uh, I did go back last year as well. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. It was it was a bit um, amazing at times to think, uh, and uh, you know that um, we we weren't seeing sort of um, the numbers that we we were used to. But yeah, we've got a. a a list and we saw some interesting things and, and several of us you know th those three distinctive species i'd never seen before and that was great um a few other things i've only ever seen once before query and the was, was the other one so yeah it was um it was quite a quite a lot of effort for, for what we did find but yeah here's just a, a, a map of, of the locations are kind of reflecting where we searched really but some whole squares just we didn't turn up anything basically which is um yeah quite amazing and um yeah so just a few of the photos these are some of the some of the highlights that a lot of people better photographs photos than me so i am majoring on those um usual suspects 
and then, but we also had you know quite a lot of other interest in the insects and all these will go on to iRecord so you know while they're not directly relevant to this it, it was worthwhile going out and capturing some of these things because I, I suspect I think Paul Carter in particular had an unusual type of um, beetle and you know we found a couple of bees nests including this one that Paul photographed um, Harry had a female stag beetle and then I turned up something even though I hadn't uh, identified it at the time I didn't even know it was there but there was a little uh, critter on the end of one of my chalc chalcus surfaces this little pseudo scorpion was hitching a ride and I'd never seen one of those before so that was really really amazing really exciting and um, yeah it was well worth doing just to see the variety of things and we turned up badges and um, you know night jars and red starts and all the other sort of stuff that you would expect in the forest but yeah it was great great from that point of view. So in terms of conclusions, um, so you know, our, our sort of question was, are Caliprobola species uh, numbers in the new forest actually declining, or is it just being significantly under-recorded um, because people always go to the same sites? And certainly, our work has shown that you know we were able to find it at Denny Wood and Mark Ashwood. But I think again, the fact that Collins turned it up at an, another new site. Um, outside of those makes me feel pretty confident that you know, more are out there outside of the, the the usual spots to be found again in the future. Um, I think it's pretty uh, telling that we contributed so much time um, and, and effort searching for it but apart from Colin's sighting we didn't really turn it up, uh, Caliparola uh, speciosa at least, um, and you know that that I think we're all fairly competent at finding hoverflies generally. I mean, I know this is a new species, but I'd like to have thought that if it was there, um, we would have seen it. But but that's probably might not be the case because we may have been moving too quickly through the habitats and not spending enough time gazing at a stump and waiting for it to to appear. Um, so yeah, that's an, another thing to to think about for our um, our next set of surveys and. Um, you know, I don't think it's really possible to say now whether whether it's declining based on what we what we've done. We just need more data, and obviously that's why we're keen to continue with it. Um, and and you know, Roger also was mentioning that if if it is declining, um, one of the the things that may be a factor is is the sort of genetic diversity. You know, you saw that map earlier. The the population in the new forest is isolated now from well isolated from the the rest of the european population if it is declining then you know there's um there's potential that that could be quite serious and and would need sort of future replenishment of you know new new, new genetics to to make that more viable again but we just don't know at the moment is is the is the is the, the sort of upshot of it all um but what we do know is that we we think we've got a better idea after this year's survey of what we should be looking for and and you know i think rather than trying to race around or, or uh, large areas of the forest looking for for it um we're probably better to, to 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 try and focus a bit more on the more open areas the the stumps that are in you know very sunny situations um and in a good state of rot and i think with the data that we've gathered we'll be able to do that in a much more effective way um and so, yeah, that's the the plan. We've got the coordinates for those trees, and you know we can do some more work on trying to understand a bit more about the requirements from published data and literature. But uh, for now, that's that's what we plan to do. And there's also the possibility to use some of the mapping techniques that I'm familiar with to kind of help prioritise those sites. So, if you look at the the acres down um, image, the central area here is uh, uh, on the edge of this heath is is where we were looking and it looked really promising but it you know and you can see some gaps but when you compare it to Denny Wood this is the campsite up here in the top middle section and then below that is the, the open area where all the sightings are so much more open and you know the dead wood in there is going to be um, in a much more sunny aspect and has the potential to, 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 to match closer to the sites where we know it's been seen previously. Um, so if we can find similar sites like this elsewhere in the forest, we can we can go and look. And uh, yeah, so this is just some of the areas I was pointing out. And you know, there's there's tools we can do to characterise that. Um, so using lidar and things like that to to try to do that automatically to help prioritise. But that's that's something that we want to look into. 
So I think it's, um, in terms of the overall conservation, as I said, it's pretty early to say, but I think we're all pretty struck by just how few hoverflies we actually saw compared to our normal sites. You know, this low HPH, as uh, Paul would put it. And the fact that we saw no surface at all, you know, surface is supposed to be a woodland species, especially with BCI, you know, um, we didn't see them. And I, I just find that quite staggering, really. Um, we also mark the fact that, you know, that could be just because there were so few flowers around and normally, you know, where you might see them alighting and feeding, we just didn't see uh, any flowers. And that fact might be due to grazing pressure. But again, we just don't have the data to know whether that's true. So again, we can perhaps contract, contact the Forest Commission or Verderers and see if, if there's anything we can do there. But basically, there's scope to do a lot more work. And so that quite nicely leads me on to the next steps, which is obviously that the team aren't deterred. We want to do this again next year. Um, we will hope to get a lot more people involved. So we'll be putting out the, the poster again and, and we'll also um, be trying to engage with local community. Um, so people like, you know, we didn't engage with Southampton Natural History Society, which was probably uh, an error because, you know, there's some good people there and, um, you know, we perhaps can talk to the Forestry Commission, but, you know, there's potential to to do a lot more. And, um, you know, there's data that we can collate and um, more analysis we can do on historical sites. But I think what we're looking for is for people to get involved. So, um, yeah, hopefully uh, that will, um, hopefully we'll get several people interested um, based on, on the presentation and, and sort of things that arise from it. Okay, so um, just want to say a quick thank you to a few people just um, who helped sort of with the surveys. Obviously, Roger and Stuart for the, the background work and all the information and input to the methodology. Uh, the Woodland Trust provided the ancient trees inventory, which has just been so useful in helping us target and probably will continue to be very useful. George and um, George Ellis and Paul Brock provided some amazing photos and lots of really useful knowledge, local knowledge, which again, I'm really looking to tap into um, in the future. You know, they're experts, recognised experts in the forest and um, we can draw on their expertise. Um, and then also, as ever, the UK Hoverfly Facebook team, um, you know, amazing work that you guys do and, and just thanks for all the, the IDs and support for all the other things that we, we did turn up during the period. And last and not least, Yanis, who's my um, Maplin partner, uh, developer of Surfboard, who, who helped with some of the analysis. So, yeah, that's it from me. Um, I'm going to uh, stop there and just ask if there are any questions. And I'll also stop presenting so you can see each other. Roger's got a raised hand. I think we should uh, start with you, Roger. Okay. Well, firstly, I thought I ought to speak first, just simply to say thank you, Andy. I thought that was excellent. Uh, both Andy and Paul, fantastic. Um, it's really good to to see a team developing and some interest developing. So well done, guys. Um, my, I had two real thoughts. The first one was um, the issue of bracken. And it did cross my mind whether the bracken was actually quite useful in the later part of the year, because it may well shield the base of the stumps from heat. Mm. So it might be use, might be a bit of an impediment, but it could have benefits in terms of maintaining more of a humid environment. I think I don't think one should probably. Uh, discount bracken at this stage it, it, it was it wasn't yeah it wasn't so much that i, I totally take the point i think that's a, a valid point I, I think it was more that it just becomes very difficult to access oh, yeah. without trampling yeah. all over it and getting covered in ticks you know the, the new forest yeah you start going off in there and <laughs> yeah no I, I i agree on that i mean i think i think that's in a way you almost need to highlight it as a hazard from the tick yeah. perspective i think that's that's actually quite important um, and probably if you get new people taking part, then, you know, a little bit of uh, education about uh, about Lyme's disease as well would probably be quite yeah. wise. Um, the other point that I was going to bring up was um, these, these relatively recently fallen beech trees. Um, once, once the sap's been um, stewing for a little while, it becomes really good for some species of hoverflies, particularly brachiopa. Mm -hmm. um, 
and I think it's probably worth just keeping an eye on those trees for the two or three years afterwards that the, the bark is intact because you do find uh, Brachiopapilosa on, on those sorts of situations. I've found them on several occasions. So it's just worth keeping an eye open for Brachiopapilosa. Um, and the other one that, that really does strike me that I had kind of expected you to turn up in the forest is Xylotarabians, which I think is is disappearing. Hmm. Um, now, it's just it's just worth flagging that as you know something next year to be alert to because it's I haven't seen it in years and and there are very very few recent records. So I, I, I'm wondering whether Xylotarabians is one to just flag us potentially in trouble. It is a new forest speciality. It does like beech trees, so. You know, and it looks horribly similar to Calca surface, so it'd be quite easy to overlook it. I think. Yeah. Okay. And and do do you think I, I'm not? I remember you raising this at the time, but I confess that I I don't really know how to identify it properly. But um, do you think it's doable from photos then? Or I have seen photographs that it's been possible. It's it, the the big issue is. I'm not sure many of us have seen very many of them. I've certainly not seen very many photographs myself. Um, and you need to get the right angle on the on the hind femora, which right. are very, very similar in in the in in that and calcus surface. Calcus surface has a much more a slightly more robust hind fem femur and a much more stepped um, uh, distal end to it on on the underside. but but nevertheless, it's it should be doable, but you know, let's. I think we just got to keep our eyes open, and particularly material coming out of the new forest, we've got to be a little bit alert to. Yeah. Okay, that's great. Um, yeah. thanks a lot for that, Roger. Does anyone else from the team that that, that hasn't spoken want to to say anything? I mean, Robin, Colin, you know, uh, Jeff's raised his hand. Why don't you go first, Jeff? I think you're on mute. Sorry. Sorry, I had a pop-up box just came up right on top of the unmute button. It was perfectly, perfectly positioned. Not. Um, thanks very much, Andy, for organising this because this this was a really good experience being involved. Um, I certainly enjoyed going out to parts of the new forest that I hadn't been to before, and I thought it was a great learning experience as we progressed because we were starting off looking in quite shady areas. But as the communication sort of built up, we realised we were looking in the wrong places, and we sort of went to more open areas. So it's a learning experience all the way through. The, the point you made about whether the um, the indicator species might be useful, so the Calica surfus, Brachy, Palpus, and Microdon, this probably is a, this is a, any n of an n equals one observation, so it's probably useless. But the the, the yeah. um, Brachy Palpus I saw was in a very densely shaded area, um, yeah. which yeah. would be where you'd ex expect um, what we now think you know Calipribola species to be. But it might be interesting to see whether the combination of those three indicator species in, is, is more predictive, um, so rather than just one or two of them. Trump, we've got we've got very small sample sizes, haven't we? Yeah, so sure. We say anything? I, I think it was Paul who, who came up with that. It was kind of more like, is there a is there a suite of of those type of species? It wasn't that we were saying there was. It's just that you know we we obviously. I think we probably thought, "Wow, these are these are great." We've we've come here, we're looking for this thing, but we've found these. Certainly, from my perspective, I've seen three new species just from that work. It was great, um, and and you know, really distinctive and and enigmatic and you know, amazing creatures they are. Um, but yeah, I I, I think the the more we we can gather data, the better. And and I think your other point about you know just how we were sharing information, you know, via uh, WhatsApp and. Uh, on on the emails was was great and obviously through the map from my perspective trying to coordinate where to try and send people was was great it was um it was really useful so yeah well it was it was a, a real eye opener seeing so few hovers per hour was was it not around that time that we were getting reports from the north sea that there were masses on oil rigs <laughs> massively yeah. more on oil rigs than there were in the new forest yeah. Yeah. It, it just all seemed a bit unbalanced <laughs> <laughs> yeah thanks jeff and i'm going to go to adam next um adam kelsey please uh do you have a question uh apologies because this might be a really stupid question but one thing that really struck me when you showed the map of europe in terms of the divide on the continent from belgium to the netherlands 
is that line literally, if you carry it across into Britain, slices off the new forest. Right. So, is the distribution potentially due to climate? I know habitat is obviously very distinctive, but if the habitat's there and climate change happens, might the northern progression change? Not that I'm expecting to see them in the northeast. I know that. <laughs> <laughs> you never know. You never know. Um, I, I don't know. It's a really good point, actually. And um, I, I think that one of the things I'm, I'm keen to do is to get into some of the literature, if I can, for for the species and on the continent, and just see what is published, um, because uh, I think there's all sorts of. Uh, things like that we, we, we could potentially explore or, or start to build a data set towards you know and um, i think um yeah there's lots of scope for more work for sure the light is very distinct but is that because of recording effort no. oh, hard. yeah i really don't know at this stage C can i come in on that andy yeah sure um, adam raises a good point there that it, it, it seems to be the sort of species that if it's at the edge of range, um, uh, then you might expect it to, to, to expand its range. This was one of the things why we were wondering about the genetic bottleneck, because um, I, think it was, I think it was probably Frank Van der Meuse, but it might have been Gerard. Uh, who suggested the genetic bottleneck because it was expanding its range in in, in Belgium, and it's not in the UK, in in Britain. Um, that tends to suggest there's something wrong with the the British fauna because there's there's certainly enough habitat, and it's a big strong flyer, um, and it's a species associated with the habitat where they do have to move because the habitat is is a, a fairly ephemeral uh, environment you know the, the the tree stumps may last i don't know five years or something like that ten years maybe i don't know <clears throat> so we do have a bit of a question mark there we we also know that there were or there was a record from isha common which i've always been a little bit skeptical about but i think it may well be a, a reasonable record um so we there are things to to come from that so adam i, I wouldn't like to uh, dampen your enthusiasm at the thought of calipropola up up where you are but i think i think it might be a little while um and the other thing to bear in mind is that you've got to look at belgium and, and the netherlands slightly differently because belgium has the ardennes which is a big beach forest whereas uh whereas the netherlands is flat and bits of heathland and wet so anyway I'll, I'll call off at that point and let okay. thanks roger for that that's useful um i'm going to go to colin next because obviously he's the only one of us who actually saw the bloody thing so um <laughs> over to you colin thanks well just just say thank you to you and paul for pulling this together it's been been, been great to uh, 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 recall the experiences of the summer the only thing i wanted to say was before when, when i started getting into this i actually spoke to paul brock and asked for any advice on on spotting these and it may not be sig statistically significant on a sample of two but he had said look in the morning and both times i spotted them was on a day that didn't start in full sun and i managed to get to the site before the sun first came out and then was hanging around during the intervals of sun early in the morning so just wanted to throw that up as a as a pointer yeah thanks very much i, I did see that in your email at the time but i i probably was again um yeah like you not sure whether a sample of of two was uh, but to be fair you, you you're doing you've got 100 percent right so far right <laughs> um okay and um, can i go to martin lavell next hi hi Th thank you very much for a very interesting talk um, it was written on one of your slides, so I just wanted to to ask um, whether people have tried to contact the Belgians to ask them those sorts of questions, um, you, you know, and, and get something more out of their expertise. Uh, not not directly from the team, um, but clearly that that's something I would like to do. R Roger is obviously um, part of the sort of wider community and in contact with a lot of these people. So if we were to do that, I guess. 
through Roger, but presumably, Roger, you've had some conversations about this species with them. Yeah, I've had I've had several conversations with Frank and Gerard. Um, I, I don't think I'm necessarily essential to the contact. Um, I mean, Gerard is extremely approachable. Frank is a nice guy. You know, get in contact with them, and they'll they'll answer. Um, yeah. Uh, particularly as, as as it concerns hoverfly conservation, which you know both of them are interested in, and and you'll find that across the, the hoverfly world, they're not, you know, it it it's 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 not sort of a uh, an aristocracy. They're um, they're just people, you know. Um, yeah. So talk to them um, if you want me to. I can, but um, no, no, I was just, just I, I, I would urge you to because I think. Yeah, yeah. Um, I think what I really like about what the, the group has done um, is that it's 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 a new initiative. It's new people coming forward and taking some prominence. So I think that's really important. You know, it shouldn't just be me and Stuart. It should be the mm. community. So I'm I would urge you to to talk to Frank and Gerard and and Sander and um, people like Menno Rima uh, uh, in the Netherlands. Um, they're, they're very helpful uh nice guys okay great stuff yeah and and martin yeah we we, we obviously had planned to do that I, I think the other thing is that at the moment we, we've only looked at the literature that's publicly accessible on the web i'm just about to become a, a visiting fellow at the university of southampton so we'll get access to all the journals and things so i'll be able to, to do a bit more digging on on that side of it um and obviously you know we'll, we'll, we'll work with the with the the rest of the team and 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 Roger to to try to identify any relevant stuff, but yeah, it's, it's clearly we, we want to try and understand more about what what we know already. You know, we don't know. We, we want to try and draw on that expertise to help us. So yeah, thanks for the question, Paul. Do, do you want to say something else? Well, I just wanted um, Colin made a point about timing uh, time in the day. Looking through, as you said, the available stuff on the web. I got three comments about, and one was one, I looked all day and didn't find it until just before I had to go and catch my train home. Um, another one was one that they seem to like, the hotter it is, the better. Hot days, that's when I found most of them. Again, it's, it's only three comments, so it's not a very large sample, but um, that's what led me to, to believe that unlike most hoverflies when you sort of tend to look for them before they get too active and they're just sunning themselves to warm up the muscles this was one where the heat of the day wasn't a problem but you know colin's experience of actually finding them yeah, as morning targets seems to have worked so i don't really know about that one yeah i mean obviously it's it's going to be something we'll talk about i guess um in, in upcoming sessions and when we plan out what we're going to do next year but um it would be nice to to revisit our strategy and you know maybe go to some of the the known sites to get some sightings and get some more experience of it you know that would be we, we deliberately didn't do that this time because we just didn't want to so we were looking for, for new places but i think you know for our own sanity and, and also our own education to, to to go to sites where you know if there's five flying around i'd think i'd have a reasonable chance of getting one of those <laughs> but um but yeah um yeah I, I, what i was most impressed by was talking to colin at that get together we had at the end of uh, the project uh, season um where he was relating how he's he's got the patience to sit at a site for a couple of hours on end staring at a stump and gets results that way i mean our hover whispery obviously is the one who's got a good technique um yeah. I'd, I'd struggle to find that kind of dedication if personally it's, it's, it's the difference between for me between being a stork that stands there by the edge of the river motionless waiting for hours until its dinner swims past i feel more like a I don't know, a sparrowhawk that careers around trying to find flush things out. And it might not be a good technique, but at least the scenery changes from time to time. I mean, maybe I need to be a bit more Colin and be, have a bit more patience, I think, is a, is a pointer. 
I don't know, I think I was a bit more like a headless chicken at times, just trying to cover too much ground, looking for stumps rather than looking for hoverflies and be, being a bit more methodical. So certainly, uh, you know, a much more static approach, I think, would, uh, or, or, you know, much more targeted. You know, Paul Carter found a really nice stump that, um, you know, was, was largely in shade, but for one part of the day, the last part of the day, it, it just comes over a clearing that they've just felled. And it's in full sun for the rest of the day. And, and just staking out something like that, even though it's at a site which we don't expect, it's sort of in between, sort of to the east of Markash Wood. I think, you know, I'd, I'd, be, I'd be spending a few hours there next summer, put it that way. Colin, do you want to come, come back in? Yeah, I, I was just going to say, I didn't tend to spend two hours on a single stump. I would identify <laughs> two or three stumps within a very brief walking distance and just keep going around in circles. So it wasn't entirely static. <laughs> yeah. Any other questions or thoughts? Excellent. Oh, Roger's just got your hand up again. Um, yeah, I, I just thought um, it would be interesting to know um, how many people from from the group actually get to watch this presentation um because what you've done could could equally be transferred to other groups i mean one could for example have a group uh out on the on dartmoor looking for aristelis cryptarum or mo mo monitoring aristelis cryptarum mm -hmm. i mean there is the Dev devon fly group but you know that there's no reason why you know uh, a group that largely comprises photographers rather than net people shouldn't go around and and monitor aristelis cryptarum um the other one that immediately comes to mind is is amongst scottish recorders maybe organize weeks where to coincide with the um the flight time of hammerschmidt here and actually visit um sections of the spay valley and elsewhere looking at, um, at Rowan for, for Hammerschmittia um, adults. You know, there are, this is a really brilliant model. Um, and what would be great would be to see a few leaders coming out in different parts of the country saying, what about if we did this? Um, I mean, I came up with a, a very quick list and, and Hammerschmittia was one, uh, Ari, um, Aristelis Cryptarum another one. Um, did I have another one? Uh, Dingle Woodlands looking for Calcosurfus Unotus uh thames estuary you could be doing something either on paragus albifrons or laops vitatus uh up in norfolk one could do something on um um anisomaya interpuncta so there are you know there are options for local groups to to have a project if 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 that really suited them yeah, uh, no, no. really encourage it. I think it's a great way of people getting involved and doing something interesting. Well, I, 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 yeah, and I, and I hope we kind of hope convey like how much we've all enjoyed it. You know, I asked at the pub whether people were up for doing it again, and there were, it was a unanimous yes straight away. You know, they were they were up for for going out and and carrying on, and you know, we've all got loads out of it. Seen seen new species and and learnt from each other and. Um, you know that that's part of the beauty of this Facebook group, isn't it? It's it's brought together a a, a random mix of people, um, and uh, we've gone out and and done something useful, hopefully, um, and hopefully it will become more useful as as time goes on. So yeah, we'd be very very happy to sort of talk about it with with other people who might be looking to set up something similar, and um, and and yeah, there's certainly scope, as you've said, to 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 do local work. That's for sure. Yeah, I think um, I think what we've got with the Facebook group is essentially um, a virtual society, and um, you know the great thing is we don't have to have treasurers, we don't have to have meetings, we don't have to have committee meetings, all the wretched things that one doesn't want to do with societies, and people can go out and do things, which is yeah. fantastic. <laughs> Excellent. Yeah. Okay. Um, I think that's it. Is it. Unless there are any more questions, we'll uh, we'll wrap it up there, and I can uh, stop the recording if I can work out how to do that. <laughs> Excellent. Well, thank you very much for, for your attention and 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 getting involved. And um, yeah, I hope to see you all again very soon. Thanks, Andy Paul. That was great. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Thanks a lot. All the best.